Yes, the history of Japan is rather interesting to say the least. From honourable samurai to big teddy anime waifus, along with a strong passion to serve the glorious emperor. Of course, in modern times, Japan is very different to its historic past. But there was one event in the 20th century that may have moulded the modern version of Japan as we see it today. I'm sure you may have heard of this event before since it's one of the most renowned historical events ever caught on camera. Otoya Yamaguchi, the assassin of Enijiro Asanuma. Please leave a like and a comment on this video because it really helps me in the algorithm. <coughs> but before we get started, this video was brought to you by Atlas VPN. Get the greatest VPN deal in the market and enjoy the most affordable online protection for just $1.83 per month with a 30 day money back guarantee. Enjoy blazing speeds and stream your favourite show in high quality or play your favourite games at a lightning fast speed, all while protecting every single one of your devices with just a single subscription. I enjoy using Atlas VPN because it is seamless, fast and easy to use. No one should have to deal with corporations, governments or hackers spying and stealing their data. Atlas VPN gives you a way to avoid all of that. I use it to watch shows on the American Netflix and Adult Swim because annoyingly they have a much better catalogue of content. You will also be safer from malware and stop annoying ads since the VPN immediately blocks all connections to malicious links, ads and trackers and it notifies you if someone tries to steal your data. Save money while shopping online and get the best deals while getting the most out of your online subscriptions such as Netflix, Spotify, airlines, hotels and even more. And right now, Atlas VPN is running a massive discount. Get a 3 year subscription at only $1.83 a month, plus 3 months with a 30 day money back guarantee. Time is running out, so get your deal by clicking the link in the description box down below, while also helping my channel. So, this all starts with World War II. Now, of course, as we all know, the Japanese lost, but the spirit of the Emperor lived on within a good amount of the population. This caused an awkward feeling throughout Japan and I'm not here to go too in depth into the socio-political relations of Japan post World War II, but to say the least things were very tense. The seeds of these political tensions had already been sown years earlier prior to World War II. Because even before then, Japan was a very nationalist country. A very nationalist country. But a new Pokemon style evolution of nationalism would now appear. And this was called ultra nationalism. A key figure in this movement who would tie in later was a fellow by the name of Bin Akao. Bin was a politician in Japan that had flip flopped between socialism and nationalism prior to World War II, but ultimately ended up landing on the side of ultra nationalism. But during this time and throughout World War II, he would only stand as an independent politician. He was a rather peculiar politician because at the time he was actually opposed to the Pacific War with the United States and he had a reverent disdain for the USSR along with communism in general. Bin, along with a few other Japanese politicians, would found the Kenko Kyukai or in English, the National Foundation Society. The main aim of this society was to create a genuine people's state based on unanimity between the people and the emperor. Basically, it was a mini fascist organisation standing against communism along with all other left-leaning parties. There were plans for establishing a full National Socialist Party after the society was formed, which would focus on breaking up union strikes across the country. 
But this would soon all fizzle out after their key leader, Motoyuki Tagabataki, passed away. But getting back to Binman, even though these efforts in the National Socialist Societies didn't work, he still ran as an independent, managing to gain quite a large amount of votes, even gaining a seat in the 6th district of Tokyo. This was during Japan's national diet, although in the runs for re-election during 1945, he lost and he was then purged by the US occupiers since he was a wartime leader. This purge would last until 1951, as part of the reverse course operation that was put in place by the US. Reverse course was basically an operation by the United States to drastically change the policies of Japan to then change the very society of Japan itself into one that could be more easily managed, so to speak. Similar to the denazification that was taking place in Germany. Because essentially when you've occupied a nation of people who will run out of the trenches at you with nothing but bayonets, not giving a single shit about the machine gun fire flying towards them while screaming in the name of the Emperor like the fucking Death Corps of Krieg, it's definitely within your best interests to get them to calm down a little bit. Finally, in that very same year, Bin Man would go on to found and head the Greater Japan Patriotic Party. After World War II, the Nationalists still had the threat of communism as there was quite a bit of dispute between both sides. This would only be heightened with the United States-Japan Security Treaty, which allowed the US to host military bases in Japan, which are still there to this day. And nationalists kind of don't like it when a foreign power has military bases in their country. You know, that kind of, that kind of pisses nationalists off a little bit. This would soon start a series of protests known as the Anpo Struggle. These consisted of both protesters on the left and right unifying against the revision of the treaty. These tensions were already pretty bad due to a previous event known as the Gerard Incident, which had already set disruption throughout the whole country. The rundown is that in 1957, a US soldier by the name of William Gerard had shot a Japanese housewife by the name of Nakasakai with an empty grenade cartridge. But even though it was empty, it killed her. Because... Metal travelling at high speeds tends to kill people. Who knew? Shocking. Nakasakai was in a local airbase at the time because most locals would collect the spent cartridges used in live fire exercises so they could sell them off as scrap for a little bit of extra money. She was then shot by Gerard for no other reason than his own amusement. You know, just a bit of banter lads, just casually murdering a 46-year-old housewife. This, I'm sure you will be very shocked to hear, caused massive upheaval and outrage throughout the whole country, and it led to various protests along with a reduction in US military personnel based in Japan. This wasn't the only event in Japan that would lead to and certainly exacerbate the ANPO protests, but sadly I can't cover all of these incidents in depth. Maybe another time. But sadly, this wasn't the only reason that there was an opposition to the United States being there in general. Other than the obvious, there was the genuine concern that having the US based in Japan would escalate the Cold War, which many people in Japan on both sides of the political spectrum wanted to de-escalate. Basically, they knew that if the Cold War went hot, Russia would then attack the US military bases in Japan and the Japanese would be caught in the crossfire of something that they wanted nothing to do with in the first place. During these protests, our friend Bin Man was very worried that there was a communist revolution coming, to which he mobilised his boys for a counter-protest. Now, this is where the main man, or should I say boy, comes into the story. Otoya Yamaguchi was born on the 22nd of February 1943 and he would grow up during a time of great political strife in Japan. There isn't really 
too much to go off in terms of his early life, but I'm sure there's some good material in Japanese museums or historical books, but we don't have the time or resources to travel to Japan and do a lot of research for one mad lad. Unfortunately. What we do know about Otoya's early life is that his household was a very nationalist one because his father, Shinpei Yamaguchi, was a high-ranking officer in the Japanese Self-Defense Force. Along with his grandfather, Murakami Namuroku, he was actually a famous writer who covered various topics such as ancient swordsmen and the Yakuza. As most political extremists start off, Otoya started reading a variety of newspapers discussing the current politics in Japan. His anger built up over time and allegedly through his brother's influence, Otoya started attending political speeches, rallies and even protests. Eventually, he would join the Greater Japan Patriotic Party at the age of just 16. No matter what side of the spectrum you look at, the best way to indoctrinate new candidates is to get them while they're young. During these protests between 1959 to 1960, Otoya would be arrested a total of 10 times, but he was constantly released with no apparent charges or backlash, presumably due to his age and the era. Now, while in the Greater Japan Patriotic Party, Otoya still wasn't happy. Apparently, Bin Man wasn't quite radical enough for him. Bin Man was a lot more focused on debating the communists along with holding protests and gaining coverage in the local media. But this was not enough for Atoya. Action was needed. But any time Atoya wanted to lash out at the communists, Bin Man would apparently stop him. So, Bin Man was against taking any sort of rash actions, but we'll talk more on that later. And because of this, Atoya had allegedly left the Greater Japan Patriotic Party to pursue his own actions against his sworn rivals, the Communists. And, like pretty much every political party out there, the Greater Japan Patriotic Party had an opposition party who were their sworn enemies. The very same enemies that Atoya wanted to take drastic action against. The Japan Socialist Party. They were communists, so Atoya absolutely hated them. But he was never allowed to do anything about it. But now that he was out on his own... That was about to change. The Japan Socialist Party was led by a man named Inijiro Asanuma. And to give him some background, Inijiro wasn't your average socialist. He had been going at the political game since before the war and post-war Japan seemed the perfect time for him to level the playing field for his political power. From a young age, he had been tied in with various labour movements and he even helped with the Russian famine relief. He was quite the vocal man when it came to Western imperialism, wanting Asia to focus solely on its own affairs without any disruption from the West. This was especially clear when he visited Chairman Mao in the Republic of China, even stating in a speech that American imperialism is the shared enemy of China and Japan. He even went as far as to wear the famous Mao suit after returning to Japan, which apparently brought a lot of criticism his way from both right and left wingers. It was a complicated situation at the time with both people from the left and right not wanting the United States to be on Japanese soil. But there was a larger tendency for the left-leaning socialists to be anti-treaty, perhaps to be more influenced by China, whereas the right-wing nationalists were more pro-treaty to prevent any form of communist revolution. This brings us to October the 12th, 1960. A televised political debate between the three major parties, including the Japan Socialist Party, the Democratic Socialist Party, and the Liberal Democratic Party, the latter of which is still in power to this day. With over 2,000 people in the audience, the talk would start at 3pm, but with a lot of disruption from right-wing groups who were heckling Inijiro. After things were calmed down by the moderators, the man of the hour would talk again. But 
barely one minute into his speech, loud footsteps could be heard off camera as Otoya Yamaguchi rushed the stage before plunging his father's wakizashi into Inijiro twice. Unfortunately for Inijiro, while he had been studying the works of Hungry Santa, Otoya had been studying the blade, and Inijiro was unable to dodge the attack. <laughs> Otoya then immediately attempted seppuku, but he was stopped by various bystanders who rushed in to stop the situation from getting even worse. And there was a note found in Otoya's pocket containing a written farewell and an explanation for his actions. And the note read... You, Enijiro Asunuma, are making Japan communist. I have no resentment towards you personally as a person with a leadership role in the Socialist Party. But to your onus, your outbursts when you visited China, and the responsibility that you bear for the intrusion into the national diet. I cannot let go of your unforgivable actions. I shall hereby be the one to bring down your divine punishment. The man, the man really pulled a, I will never forgive you, in his fucking suicide note. Right after the attack, Inijiro was rushed to hospital, but he died on the way there. At first, it didn't look too bad, as there wasn't a lot of bleeding, but when you get a foot-long sword dipped in you twice, yeah, that's, that's a lot of damage, which came in the form of puncturing his aorta. And for you less biology learned viewers out there, that's the big vein that goes to your heart. Hearty big vein, hearty, no hearty, hearty bad bad. So at the age of just 17, Otoya Yamaguchi had committed one of the most well-known political assassinations to this day, which changed Japan's political climate completely. Did he completely prevent a communist revolution? Potentially, actually, but... It's hard to say since there are a lot of factors at play. But Otoya certainly did have an influence on it, as the Japan Socialist Party declined and withered away after the loss of their critical leader. Because Inijiro was a major well-known figure with a huge culture of influence. People didn't identify with the party, they identified with him. You know, it was like... American socialism losing Bernie. It was like the MAGA movement losing Trump. Or it was like UKIP losing Nigel Farage right before an election. Thanks, Nigel. The event resulted in this now very famous image, which was captured by photographer Yasushi Nagao. This image would go viral back then, and it ended up being considered one of the most iconic political photographs from history. But, it also resulted in a lot of memes. So, what happened to Atoya after the assassination? Well, of course, he was arrested and awaited trial, but like most loyal servants to the Emperor, they usually don't let the authorities have enough time for a trial. While in prison, Otoya was apparently quite calm during all of this, keeping a good posture and even giving testimony to the police. But his calm composure would come to an end. On the 2nd of November, Otoya Yamaguchi would take a tube of toothpaste and use it to write the following message on the wall of his cell. Long live the Emperor. Would that I had seven lives to give for my country. These final words were inspired by a famous samurai in Japan by the name of Kusunoke Masashige, which Otoya probably learned about from his grandfather's novels and traditional upbringing. Every time I hear Japanese people talking about the emperor, I keep thinking about some weird mix of Japan and 40k. Oh, oh, oh.
Otoya then fashioned the sheets from his bed into a rope and Epstein himself. Except Otoya had a light fixture to do it from, so it was actually a suicide. From there, Otoya became somewhat infamous in Japan, with people both loving and hating him. This would also stretch out to other parts of the world, influencing many people, but mostly right-wing people. We aren't sure what particular group, but a right-wing group in Japan actually celebrated Atoya as a martyr for their cause, even providing his family with a burial coat along with some other articles of ceremonial clothing. Otoya was finally laid to rest at Aoyama Cemetery after he was cremated. As for Enijiro, he was also buried and he was also somewhat revered after his death, especially in various socialist groups. Interestingly enough, he was buried in the very same cemetery as Yukio Mishima, which is kind of ironic. Funnily enough, you can actually see the very suit that Enijiro was wearing when he was banzaied because it's on display in a museum. So what were the repercussions of the assassination? Well, there were a few things that happened. Of course, the decline of the Socialist Party and any idea of Japan becoming communist soon faded. Along with this, it had spurred up a variety of right-wing groups in Japan, which are commonly named Uyuko Dantai. This is just a general title for right-wing groups, which included the National Foundation Society and Greater Japan Patriotic Party, as we've mentioned earlier. This event would even inspire famous Japanese writer Kenzaburo Oe to write two books on Atoya, though these were more critical breakdowns than a fan fiction. Although these groups I've mentioned would slow down over time, new ones would emerge, with the estimates ranging from over a thousand groups since 1996. Otoya would become almost like a folk hero to them, with these groups celebrating the assassination of Enijiro, with there even being a large celebration on the 50th anniversary of Otoya's actions. <laughs> Another incident that I have to mention is known as the Shimanaka incident, which happened after the assassination. This has been called a copycat crime of Otoya's actions, and it was basically a mixture of the Enijiro assassination and the Charlie Hebdo shooting. So let me explain this one. Not everyone in Japan at the time liked the idea of the emperor, and post-World War II there was a lot of self-censorship so as not to insult the emperor or the royal family, because there were pretty dire consequences for doing so. This awkward feeling would be called the chrysanthemum taboo, after the flower on the imperial seal. Basically, no one wanted to discuss any sort of criticism against the imperial family because it was considered taboo. And you know what Japan is like with their taboos. So, as mentioned with the Anpo protests, there was a lot of tension between the communist protesters and the imperial family. This, of course, had a lot of media coverage and a particular short story called The Tale of an Elegant Dream was written discussing the protests, mostly containing satire and jokey cartoons. But one of these cartoons was of the imperial family 
being beheaded with a guillotine by a communist lynch mob. This, of course, was not received very well by the ultra-nationalists, along with the Imperial Household Agency, who demanded an apology. But, of course, there was some debate over freedom of speech and allowing artistic freedom for media outlets. Some have also even debated if this was a direct attack on the Emperor, or if it was more to underline the actions of the communist protesters by showing how rash and unreasonable they can be. The magazine company Chuo Koron did eventually buckle under pressure and issued a formal official apology. But most right-wing groups, including the followers of our old friend Binman, were still very unhappy. So on the 1st of February 1961, a new upcoming 17-year-old named Kazutaka Komori would follow in Atoya's footsteps. He would break into the house of Hoji Shimanaka, the president of Chuo Koron, in order to strike him down with imperial might. Instead, Hoji wasn't home, but his wife and housekeeper were. Either way, Kazutaka was in too deep and he stabbed Shimanaka's wife, fortunately only injuring her, but then he murdered the housekeeper after a struggle. The next morning, Kazutaka would turn himself in to the police, claiming that he had acted alone without influence from anyone. He also had a handkerchief on him which had the following message written on it. Long live the Emperor. Who would hesitate to sacrifice his life for the sake of the Emperor and the nation, since the life of a man is as transient as a dewdrop on a blade of grass? Bit gay. Even though Kazutaka had stated that he acted alone, he had only just resigned from the Greater Japan Patriotic Party the very morning of the attack, which of course raised some suspicion. Two teenagers in the same political group that resign just before they try to do two politically driven assassinations, a little bit of a pattern is starting to form. This would be followed up with Bin Man being arrested on conspiracy of murder, in particular for the Shimanaka incident, but there wasn't enough evidence for any kind of conviction. But, you know Japan, you can't go through the legal system without some sort of repercussions, and he was charged for some lesser offences, such as disturbing the peace. But what about Kazutaka? Well, he was still legally a child, so the state actually waited until he was an adult and then tried him for murder. He was convicted and sentenced to 15 years in prison, but died during his sentence. The author of the actual cartoon himself, Shichiro Fukuzawa, would be fine, thankfully, but over the years he would receive several death threats. I can't really explain how viral Atoya went other than to discuss his merch. Yes, merch. Can you name any other assassin who has merch that people wear? From t-shirts to even patches, which of course the average K-browser would buy along with their Rhodesian bush hat. I mean, Jesus, people were even making figurines of Atoya. This one I found was actually showed off at the Shizuoka Hobby Show in 2011. Sadly, we don't know who the author is since I can't translate spilled ramen. So, while everyone was showing off all their Star Trek figurines and model trains and tanks, this... Chudkun turned up with a model that he made of a man who literally nanayed a kami on national TV. Now, a lot of you are going to say that Atoya Yamaguchi's actions were based, but I do have to remind you that I do not condone these sorts of political attacks. I don't condone them, but I will joke about them, Tenoheka Banzai. It's Count Dankula on YouTube! Everybody says, subscribe!